Uh, really excited to share with you today. I have a couple of different stories around weeds in terms of uh, resistance mechanisms and then weed movement and how we can use molecular biology and genomics to study those. And then kind of finishing looking ahead to, you know, what are some of the next things we could be working on in the area. Um, well, let's jump in. First of all, this is a photo. Uh, we're at Fort Collins for Colorado State University, and it's an area where sugar beet is kind of a both historically important for the region. And then recently, well, it still is a major crop. And here you can see a field that's full of kochia. Kochia is a tumbleweed. If you think of your old westerns, you know, right before the showdown, tumbles across. It's uh, this one right here. And that is, uh, it's a big issue. And, and the herbicide resistance that we're studying in that and other species is certainly a, a major problem. And we all know the critical challenges that we're dealing with in terms of how do we feed the world and clothe the world sustainably and, and provide all, all the plant services, ornamentals, and things that we need? So essentially, we know productivity needs to increase, and this needs to happen with fewer inputs or less money spent on inputs, less water, clearing less land, all in the face of challenges from climate change, shifts in species, shifts in pest problems, supply chain issues. And so where do weeds fit into all of that? You know, well, they take away the yield potential. So of course, you know, uh, from plant breeder perspective, uh, the, the seed that you put in the ground has a certain yield potential to start with. And then all the issues come along to try to take away from that, whether it's stress, drought, pathogens, uh, insects, and weeds. This is a graph from a, a review paper kind of looking at the different types of loss potential that might happen due to weeds, pathogens, viruses, insects, et cetera. You can see weeds are a big chunk of the loss potential, but due to crop protection practices, and this includes everything, so we're thinking herbicides as well as your management, uh, you know, cultural, biological, et cetera, those actual losses are less, but they're still there. They can typically be in the range of, you know, five, 10 percent in, in a lot of crops in different regions. And then what's the contribution of pesticides to that? There, there is a, a component of it. So thinking about how can we, you know, better use the herbicides that we have as well as those that may be coming. When we look at the herbicide world market, it's a really interesting situation in that we have 26 modes of action. But four of those, you can see here indicated in the darker colors, four of those in the, make up more than 50% of the herbicides that we use. And that's really pretty shocking. One of those, this uh, group nine, is glyphosate or Roundup. So more than 25% of global sales, that one herbicide. And then within these three groups over here, there are a lot of different herbicides within them, but they all have the same mode of action. They're all working on the same target site. So there's incredible selection pressure. If you take into account the next two, it's almost three quarters of herbicide use is six modes of action. So you can see that results in incredible selection pressure and a lot of resistance. You can see we've got, you know, nearly every herbicide side of action has resistance, lots of different countries, lots of different crops. So clearly both a global issue and then depending wherever you are, you have very local issues due to this. Now, what is resistance? Resistance is a result of an evolutionary process when we're putting the selection pressure on weed populations with a lot of genetic diversity, you're selecting for any trait that allows those plants to survive. And in the world of resistance mechanisms, there are many different ways by which this is possible. We know that generally resistant individuals are present uh, at a very low frequency, but then with repeated use of herbicides, they'll survive and they'll contribute more progeny to the population. I always enjoy this picture. This is one that Phil Wester took in 2011. And what are you looking at here? So this is a this is a dryland system. You know, the, this area, eastern Colorado, typically gets maybe 15 inches of rain a year. So they'll alternate fallow and crop cycle. During the fallow period, in order to do no-till or reduce till, which of course is building up soil carbon, residue, uh, soil health, all these things. They don't do tillage, they use herbicides to control the weeds. So they've applied the herbicide glyphosate or Roundup out on this field, and you can see lots of dead, this is kochia, but this one green streak is where one of those tumbleweeds broke off and dropped off all of its seeds. And then the next year they've come through and sprayed, and you can see they're all just this nice little track. You'd imagine how it tumbled right across, took a little turn. Uh, even 
Uh, some groups in Canada have done research where they put a GPS tag on a tumbleweed and let it go, and they'll go for miles and you know drop tens of thousands of seeds as they go. And you can imagine then how the population would grow from here if you use glyphosate again the next year. All of these will have a big advantage and make lots of seeds. So that is resistance. Another way to look at these kind of top four or five mode of action groups, and when I say mode of action, just meaning kind of the way the herbicide works and the specific target it has in the plant. Here you can see the top five most herbicide, top five most used groups are the same top five for cases of resistance. So it makes sense. The more selection pressure you have, the more cases of resistance are there. And you can see over the decades how, you know, there have been different separate spikes in resistance, but, you know, more recently the ALS and ACCAs inhibitors have increased in the 80s and then Roundup Ready crops and soybean and corn and cotton in the 90s and 2000s, uh, leading to, you know, kind of the spike of glyphosate resistance. So it's a global issue. Then it's not just resistance to single herbicides, it's resistance to multiple herbicides within a population. So what you're looking at here is the data on wheat species resistance to more than one. And so you can see there are a whole lot that have four, five, six, you know, up to 11 different modes of action within a species. And then within a, a given site, so this is multiple herbicides within a population, you know, two, three, four, five different modes of action within a population. Now we do have some, some populations even resistant to six modes of action. And species like the amarantha species, water hemp, palmer amaranth that are dioecious, there are many weeds that are obligate outcrossers. So resistance traits can combine, you know, they're, they're crossing with each other. Pollen can move quite a long ways. You know, Lynn, you did that great work with Palmer Amaranth measuring how far it moves and uh, not easy to do, right? But, um, the, you know, gene flow in weeds, even though they don't get up and fly around, you know, the, the traits can still move and, uh, and combine. And this is an example of uh, one population with five different modes of action of resistance, yet actually no history of 2,4-D use. So just selection with a different mode of action resulted in a cross resistance to a, a different herbicide. Another issue is that for decades, the herbicide discovery industry has regularly produced new active ingredients, new discoveries. And, you know, so, you know, if you're thinking in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there's something new coming out every year. But a number of factors came together that really have dropped off that discovery rate and we could have a conversation about what those are, but if you look at the kind of this bold line right here, these are herbicides that are labeled, available, and sold in the United States in soybean and corn that could actually control this weed Palmer amaranth. And you can see that's up to, I think about nine here. And then this line is resistance. So once resistance is reported in the species, that's what gets you a data point right here. And notice how this line over the last you know, say 15 years, its slope is very steep, right? And it's going to intersect this line of discovery and development quite soon, meaning there are essentially no effective modes of action for that species anymore. So what do we do about that? It's costing around $350 million typically to discover and develop a herbicide. Uh, you know, of course, there's all kinds of stuff going on with non-chemical smart weed control, uh, but, you know, we've got to do better. And that's, you know, how can we think about resistance from an integrated pest management framework. The people work on the economics and the sociology, knowing this is a so-called wicked problem and that it's just, you know, so many factors go into why people make the decisions that they make related to management. So that's an incredibly important area. What do we do about it? What action steps do we take? As you can see here, you know, maybe we can continue to discover a few more new modes of action, but we need non-chemical, we need emerging technologies, uh, creative mixtures. And then what I want to talk to the rest about today is how genomics can inform management. So how can we use tools to evaluate how well did we do with that uh, herbicide application? Can we identify the species and can we monitor what's going on out there? I'd like to tell you about, uh, for this next section, we'll talk about resistance mechanisms and just to define what do we mean by that. The mechanism itself can be any trait. There are many types of resistance traits to slow down or reduce how much the herbicide gets to the active site. You know, the, the herbicide is actually acting maybe in the chloroplast or at an enzyme in the cytoplasm, wherever it may be. 
or to reduce, so reducing how much of the herbicide gets there or reducing how much activity it has once it gets there. So it's not binding to its target site as well. So we'll talk about a target site mutation. This could be a mutation in the gene encoding that protein so that it takes more of the herbicide to knock out the activity of that protein. That's what we call a target site mutation. We can also have increased expression of that target site gene or extra copies of it. The thing about these target site mutations is that they are specific to one mode of action group. You know, the mutation in that gene doesn't give resistance to a totally different type of herbicide because it has a different target site. The other broad category of resistance mutations is what's called non-target site resistance. So these are all the things like enhanced metabolism. Plants do have the capacity to break down uh, xenobiotic compounds from the outside. You know, certainly this has evolved over the years for defense against herbivores and uh, you know, all the different things a plant might encounter. Some of those happen to metabolize herbicides. Plants also are incredible biochemical factories. So sometimes a herbicide molecule has a similar structure as uh, maybe a synthesis pathway. You can have alteration in how the herbicide moves around and it can get stored into a vacuole or someplace where it wouldn't have activity. Reduction in how much is taken up. And then I'll show you one example of a rapid necrosis or rapid cell death. Essentially, the leaves can respond so quickly to the herbicide and die that the herbicide doesn't move around anymore. This mechanism of enhanced metabolism is probably one of the most difficult to deal with from the perspective that it can give you this potential for cross resistance. So selection with one herbicide in the past might give you already, those plants might be resistant to the herbicide you'd use next, maybe even to the herbicide that hasn't even been discovered yet because of the, you know, the shared chemical features. So that's the, the really vexing one. So I'll tell you a couple of specific examples now. First of all is uh, the synthetic auxins. These are called group four within the herbicide classification. And these are include some of the oldest herbicides and some of the newest. There's still ongoing herbicide discovery in this area. Q4D was uh, you know, discovered and synthesized in the 40s and really you know, introduced as the first synthetic chemical herbicide in the late 40s and 50s. And what these herbicides do is they mimic oxen or indole acetic acid, the, the plant hormone controlling you know, so much about cell division, cell growth. So you can see the structures of one called dicamba and one called Q4D. These are herbicides that have been used for years. They're selective it, uh, between grasses and dicots for the most part. So you would traditionally use these in corn, in cereals like wheat and barley to control broadly weeds. However, uh, from transgenic trait perspective, you have uh, things like Roundup Ready Extend. So they have a metabolism gene to break down dicamba or enlist has a transgenic gene to metabolize 2,4-D. So now you can make soybean, which is normally very sensitive to both these herbicides, resistant to dicamba and 2,4-D. This thereby expands the use of these herbicides. And uh, so there are concerns, well, certainly with the dicamba around their off-target movement, but for the potential for resistance, when you have older herbicides and now you're kind of suddenly expanding the use. Here, this also gives you a picture of just how much these are used. Uh, you can see 2,4-D at the bottom. Uh, these are a bit old data now from 2014, but you know over 160 million hectares of 2,4-D use followed by dicamba. This definitely needs to be updated now with the full commercialization of these crops, but I'm sure you know, somebody can track that down. This graph is from weedscience.org. So if you're ever interested in kind of the current status of herbicide resistance, you can go there. This is the survey web page. I just pointed out these are all the species resistant to group four herbicides. Sometimes people kind of say, you know, for synthetic oxen herbicides, we don't see as much resistance. And it is true that the pace has been kind of slower. When you consider these herbicides were first used here in the 50s, you know, a couple of cases, but for the most part, you know, maybe we're seeing more resistance recently. When you look at the mechanisms, there are now a few of these that, that we know. Uh, so we, these orange ones are showing target site. This blue one is a case of metabolism, and some of them remain unknown. So I'm going to show you one example of a target site and one example of metabolism for synthetic oxygen. To say a little bit about the mode of action, uh, you know, certainly it is complicated, but what I want you to understand just for the purpose of today is that oxygen acts by 
kind of releasing inhibitors of transcription. So there are lots of genes controlling uh, cell growth that are kind of to have a transcription factor on the gene ready to go to turn it on. And then there's a repressor on top of that called an oxide protein. So that's, uh, that's what's shown right here in step one. This is the, the DNA, the promoter in front of the gene. Uh, this one, for example, is NCED that leads to the synthesis of ABA, abscisic acid. And there are others, you know, leading to the synthesis of ethylene. And uh, a number of different things get turned on by oxygen. So under normal conditions, just a little bit of oxygen in the cell, this gets degraded right here. You can see this whole complex called tier one comes in and oxygen is kind of the glue binding those together. So it will take it away and degrade it. Then that releases this transcription factor to turn on the gene. Normally what happens is that's very carefully regulated. When you now can insert a huge amount of synthetic oxygen, all of this oxide repressor gets taken away. Genes like NCD get turned on, you get sudden synthesis of other hormones, that's cystic acid, ethylene, and the plant just kind of grows out of control. And uh, that's essentially how oxygen herbicides work. And then you get plant death. So this target site right here, this oxide, these are really fascinating gene family. Plants generally have 20 or 25 different genes. And so they kind of have different functions, somewhat redundant, somewhat specific. And I, yeah, I think, from herbicide resistance perspective, we have a lot more to learn about these. But the case of target site resistance I want to tell you about is in a, a mustard species. It's called Cisimbrium orientala. What you're looking at here, uh, this is from Adelaide and South Australia. The resistant plants on top, this is showing number of days after treatment with a somewhat regular dose of 2,4-D, 250 grams per hectare. So the resistant plants really don't show much epinastine. Epinasty is the stem twisting and leaf curling that happens when these herbicides are applied. Whereas the susceptible plants, this is very typical. You can see at two days, three days, notice how twisty this is getting and the plant will eventually die. So these plants appear like they're kind of just not perceiving uh, the 2,4-D very much. You know, they have a very different response. So the first thing I had, this is an example of, you know, sometimes science takes a while. Uh, Anita Cooper started in 2014 and graduated in 2018, and then uh, another student picked up the project. But right at the end of FERS, uh, we used an RNA-seq approach on F3 recombinant inbred lines. So we made a cross, uh, got F2s, and self-pollinated those. And what we discovered in this gene, it's called IA2. Uh, the resistant plants all had this kind of gap in coverage. What you're looking at here is the alumina reads aligned to the, this gene sequence. Notice how susceptible has the gray area represents read coverage, and there's a total gap right here. So we noticed that and thought, okay, this seems worth following up on. And then the next student to work on it, Marcelo Figueredo, he uh, then confirmed that, yes, in fact, there's a deletion. So check out, this is the gene sequence right here of IA2, what it normally looks like. And then there are 27 nucleotides that are deleted in the resistant allele nine amino acids, but it stays in frame. It doesn't break the protein. It's in a region called the Dagron tail. Now, what is, why is that important? The Dagron, this is a well-characterized region with this GWTPV sequence. That's where oxygen actually binds. So if you mutate in particular this glycine, that gives resistance, but it also has a trade-off in that it doesn't bind oxygen as well either. This one is quite interesting. So this Dagron tail is in between these two domains. And what it turns out, you can see here in modeling this, that it obviously it makes the protein shorter. There's less distance between the Dagron and what's called the PBI domain or domain three. Then in this three-dimensional model, we worked with Frank Dayan on this. Uh, what you can see here, so this little part that dips down, uh, the bottom protein is tier one. And this little part going down is binding with 2,4-D right here. And what happens once that binds, the uh, herbicide kind of, uh, sorry, the Oxide protein is able to kind of embrace tier one, uh, almost think like a hug. So the, the Dagron is here and the PD1 domain has to get to the other side. And that's what allows the ubiquitination to happen for it to be degraded. In the case of the resistant, these two things can't bind at the same time. There's not enough room. So either the Dagron can bind or the PBI domain can bind, but not both at the same time or just much less efficiently. They, it tends to fall apart. So this is why the resistance works. The 2,4-D can't get this protein degraded anymore. 
but it still has all of its parts to stay on the DNA and be a repressor. So when 24D comes in, all these genes are no longer responding. And as you might expect, when you overexpress this, it appears to have a big effect on the phenotype. So this is in Arabidopsis, we you know, clone the gene and then uh, do a transgene into Arabidopsis. Uh, so here you can see uh, this plant is expressing the wild type of IAT. So overexpressing that, no big deal for the growth. When they're heterozygous as well, maybe you know, not too much of an effect, but these are homozygous lines for the mutation. And they're just, they don't grow very fast. They make very little seed. In fact, it's hard to work with experimentally. We can barely get enough seed of these to keep the line alive. So clearly overexpressing it is, is bad because then auxin itself is not able to signal the regular growth and, and development. Here you can see the data showing how, that this mutation does give resistance. Uh, so these are the same Arabidopsis lines you can see at the top that uh, with the two resistant events are still growing when they're on 24D and dicamba. Uh, as well, they're kind of maybe a bit sensitive to auxin itself, but not as much. And then the susceptible ones, you can see their growth is completely inhibited by 24D. And, uh, and what's interesting is that this mutation then also gives resistance to, to dicamba. So within this group of herbicides, 24D and dicamba have a different structure. They're considered a different chemical family. And that is uh, kind of an interesting thing to know that uh, this mutation gives resistance to both 24D and to dicamba. And we found a number of other synthetic oxygens that it also gives resistance to. So there's more to understand about that specific molecular binding. Then I mentioned, you know, overexpressing the transgene is negative. However, here we have F5 inbred lines. So they're either homozygous for the resistant mutation or homozygous for susceptible. The rest of their genetic background has been kind of recombined so that we're not comparing two very different genotypes. And you can see they have essentially the same seed production. They have the same growth curve. So we don't see evidence of a fitness cost for this allele in when it's under its native promoter. And so I think that's what's also important is see, this gene appears to be kind of a stress responsive gene. It's really not expressed much normally. So, I, you know, there's just a lot more dynamics here to understand, but very interesting that, that this uh, mutation, when it's, again, native promoter, these are not stressed plants, you know, they're not under competition or anything, but it, it doesn't appear to have uh, much of a negative effect. Then finally, this is the model that Marcelo put together to, to kind of show, and it's just what I was talking about here, you can see it a bit better. You see how the Dagron comes in and it binds there, and then this PDI domain can reach across. Whereas when you have this little part in between, it's just that much shorter. The Dagron can bind, but, but PBI can't, and you keep uh, repression of transcription. Interestingly, you could make this mutation in crops if they have a homolog of this gene. You do gene editing and take out part of that Dagron tail. And uh, so, yeah, this was pretty exciting work where I think. Now we have with this insight in terms of the oxide genes, we start looking at other examples of 24D resistance, et cetera. We may look at those target sites. I think about non-target sites, I mentioned rapid necrosis. This is some work that a sandwich PhD student from Rio de Janeiro did, uh, Jessica Leal. She came to uh, our lab at Colorado State and worked for a year. This is Kaniza sumatrensis that's resistant to 24D. And as you know, 24D is kind of fairly fast acting, but this is what several plants typically look like. Again, you have epinaski twisting, but these resistant plants, if you can see it on the screen, these leaves are totally dead, the older leaves at uh, 24 hours, or this is 48 hours after application. But you see it, you see them start to really darken and look water soaked within hours. So somehow the plants are perceiving 24D and triggering a rapid cell death pathway. This is one that we're kind of trying to take a genetic mapping approach to, to see if we can figure out but um, very fascinating response. So the second story I want to tell you about is from, uh, again, Marcelo Figueredo. So he's working on 24D resistance in water hens, Amaranthus tuberculatus. And in this case, this is a, the type of enhanced metabolism. So this was a, a water hen that was, it evolved in Nebraska in a seed production field. So grass seeds, and they're using 24D year after year. These are the, the known metabolic pathways for 24D. So in, this is the same for oxen, actually. In, in plants, there's a conjugation by this enzyme DH3 to uh, typically to some amino acids or sometimes to a sugar. 
and or amino acids followed by the sugars, I should say. And that's reversible. So this is the way that the plant can store oxygen, have it ready to go, but kind of inactive, and then cleave that amino acid so it's, it's very available. A way to inactivate it, however, is with an oxidation reaction. So here you can see uh, a lot of times we see this in monocots in grasses that are resistant to P4G. They'll metabolize the ring, hydroxylate it, and that inactivates its activity as an oxygen. So looking at water hemp, first thing to point out is that it does have a rather different response. See how they do show epinaphy. So the resistant plants are on the bottom at 500 grams per hectare, so a little bit higher dose than the other ones. Notice how they do twist, uh, the stem really bends, and then after four or five days, they start straightening back out. The plant does kind of retain this bend in its stem the rest of its life, so you know, that damage is done, but is able to recover. Whereas the sensitive plants, very, very sensitive, you know, they just fall over and they're twisting and, and, um, and they're done. So that is now, you know, kind of looking at other examples of oxygen herbicides, you can kind of ask, are they showing epinaphy or not? In that perhaps you might ask, is this plant, it's perceiving oxygen, right? Oxygen is doing some of its things and then it's able to recover after a while. And that then is kind of consistent with this idea of enhanced metabolism. On the left, where you're looking at is the these are HPLC chromatographs from they use a radioactive labeled 2,4-D molecule. So in the sensitive plants, you have the 2,4-D peak and basically one main metabolite peak. And in resistant plants, you have a much smaller 2,4-D peak and three distinct peaks, including that first one, but that one's much smaller. Now on the right here, you're looking at the degradation of, of 2,4-D in the plant over time. Basically, you see that the resistant plants are metabolizing it um, five times faster than susceptible plants. So, you know, you're just, so they're clearing 2,4-D out of their system. And then to uh, further go on, Marcelo did this work to identify what these metabolites were. So he purified them off the column and went to the NMR and the mass spec and got all this data. So the metabolite one here, what um, is going on is it's being conjugated uh, to an aspartic acid. And that's, that's what metabolite one here is, but that's reversible. That's still essentially available to 4D. But in the resistant plants in red, what's happening is you're getting a hydroxylation at this five uh, carbon position. And then we don't even actually see that, that metabolite's very labile, or I think this is just a very reactive group because right away what happens is a glucose gets added. And then a malonyl is added to that glucose. So now this is totally, well, I'll show you the data, but this is inactive and it's going to be incorporated into you know, cell wall or vacuole, and it's not reversible. We uh, ran the experiment with malathion. So malathion is an insecticide, but it also inhibits some cytochrome P450s in the plant. And what you can see in the data here is that resistant plants without malathion, you know, they're surviving very well. But when you add malathion, they essentially start to look like susceptible. So you're, if you're able to knock out this metabolism, you re revert to susceptibility. So it suggests they don't have a target site mutation. Then this data, um, you know, sometimes I, you have to acknowledge the, the people who are in the lab doing all the work because Marcelo probably spent more than a year to synthesize these molecules, especially this one right here. And, um, it's an incredible amount of work. But then what he was able to do is he took a Arabidopsis and grew them on agarose with these different compounds. So 2,4-D itself, you know, highly, has, has a high biological activity. You can see it's uh, I-75 of 0.012 micromolar. But then for the aspartic acid, this is the reversible one. It loses a lot of oxygen activity. It's a hundredfold less active than 2,4-D itself. Then this hydroxylated one, completely knocked out, right? Um, what, 20,000 times less oxygen activity. So you really, you know, you have to be at 100 micromoles compared to 0.01 uh, to start to have some oxygen activity from that one. And then you also had this school system where we had a, there's a gas reporter that's linked to a oxygen responsive gene in Arabidopsis. So with that tool, he's able to show, you know, 2,4-D at 0.01 and 0.1, you see how you're getting this blue color that shows you oxygen signaling is happening. With aspartic acid, you know, you have to go to higher concentrations and with the five hydroxylated, you can see even at hundred micromolar, you're not getting any blue color. 
So it shows that these metabolites are formed very rapidly in the resistant plants and they've lost their biological activity. We worked with Pat Channel and Darcy Giacomini to try to map these genes. And what we got to was on chromosome four, uh, there are some cytochrome P450s on one arm of that chromosome, and one of them is called CYP81E. And all the mapping kind of points to it. Here you can see in some expression data that it's, you know, kind of fourfold higher in resistance. Um, actually, I think, well, this, this uh, CYP3 as well, this is the one that really has a big difference. It's four times higher in resistance than S untreated. It is induced in both RNS. So we're looking at all of these. So far, we haven't been able to show that any of these three actually metabolize 2,4-D in a, in a different heterologous system, but we're still working on it. It may just be something with, with the expression. Uh, we're using a yeast expression system as, as one of the main tests. So there's, there's more to understand, but we think it could be this uh, CYP81E gene. Then what's, you know, current situation, this is Palmer Amaranth again uh, from Larry Steckel in Tennessee, where you know they're using this uh, extend soybean with that camber resistance and so here you can see the the field dose is kind of here 280 grams per hectare and they're surviving that and, and surviving up to two and three times that that dose so now the question will be is this metabolism is it target side is it a combination is it something else uh, again so much to understand about oxygen resistance so that's where you know, we need to understand more about these cross resistance patterns from the target site genes, understand more about the interaction with the target site, then thinking about metabolism, how is that working? Um, you know, for to some extent, we're not really seeing the cross resistance from metabolism in this case, but uh, again, more to understand. And then, of course, the rapid response. We definitely need weed genomes to study these. So, we're working with gene families and trying to map, um, as we think about the increasing use of dicamba and 2,4-D, this is just gonna continue to be very critical, both for management and, and understanding. So next I'd like to talk about how weeds move around and how can we identify them better and be more informed about, about what's happening. And this is the genus Amaranthus. So you'll be familiar with a lot of these, things like tuberculatus or water hemp, retroflexus, redwood pygmy weed. Of course, it includes uh, Palmer amaranth. Photos here, as they start to flower, you can identify them, but at the seedling stage, it's incredibly difficult. And what's even more difficult is at the seed stage. You know, so here are the seeds of uh, four different species. And if you're if you have a whole pile of them, maybe you could kind of differentiate them. But if you have one or two, uh, virtually no chance. And so the issue in the ag industry recently has been that. Uh, some of these species are very common around North America. Some of them, such as Palmer amaranth, are uh, kind of expanding their range. And some states, including Minnesota, Iowa, Ohio, have listed Palmer amaranth as a prohibited noxious weed. So seed analysts will be looking at, uh, for example, pollinator mixes or things for conservation reserve planting, you know, kind of species. And they'll look at the do this analysis, they can identify it to amaranthus, the genus. So they'll put that on the seed tag. Now it can't be sold in those states without restriction if you, you don't know if it's Palmer amaranth or not. We had a collaboration with the University of Minnesota, and we developed some genetic markers uh, using what's called TAF. So these are basically a single nucleotide or um, you know genetic variant genotyping competitive assay. Very nice because it's fast, it's high throughput, it's cheap. And we developed three different markers. We're able to extract DNA from a single seed and to say yes or no, is it Palmer amaranth or not? We can also take a mixture of up to 200 seeds with containing just one Palmer amaranth and detect it. That's what this data is showing down here in orange is uh, kind of the signal that you get for 100% for Palmer amaranth compared to water hemp. So the signal is, is up here for water hemp and everything in between down to as low as a half percent or one in 200. And then a couple of photos just to, to point out, this is uh, one that a friend of mine, Lothar Lawrence, who uh, now works at Bayer, took in 2009. This is the back of a cotton picker. And so you can imagine how much weed seed is ending up on there if the plants can actually grow on it if it's still driving around and, and picking. So, you know, these weeds do move and, and this equipment gets bought and sold, including internationally. So 
just from the perspective of hygiene and preventing leaf seed introduction. And then this is a concerning one. I know, you know, here in New York State, you have a, a few populations of Palmer amaranth, and this is uh, in Oregon, where until now, the Pacific Northwest, Palmer amaranth has not been there. But Joel Felix recently sent this photo around to a group of uh, weed scientists, and he sent us some leaves from these plants, and we were able to confirm that it was, in fact, Palmer amaranth, although it's pretty easy from the photo <laughs> to tell, too. Um, now, also thinking further about movement, I want to share this story. So Palmer amaranth is uh, an invasive weed in South America. It's been in the records known in Argentina since the 80s, but it was never documented in Brazil or Uruguay until the, uh, maybe 2015 or so. And so Paul Neve, who is at uh, Rothamsted in the UK, um, got some funding for this project, and we worked with uh, Aldo Morado in Brazil, Alejandro Garcia in Uruguay, and Martin Vilayub in Argentina, got samples from those countries, and then did, uh, you know, genotype by sequencing, got, you know, these kind of markers across the genome, and asked questions about how related they were to each other, how related they were to populations in the U.S., as well as whether or not they had the marker that we have for glyphosate resistance, which is increase of the target site gene. There's a duplication for uh, the target site gene, ETSPS. So what we found is that uh, there's pretty strong evidence for separate introductions into Argentina and Brazil, which you know we kind of knew that from the historical record, but the data confirmed it. Potentially, um, depending on how you look at the data, you might argue that there's a separate introduction to Uruguay or perhaps um, a similar one from Brazil that, that moved around these are the uh, plots from structure analysis. So the, the analysis supported a K of three, or you know, three different groups. The one of eight is also kind of interesting. I always thought this was, so you looked at Colorado, this is just one that we had in Eastern Colorado and um, appears to have some similarity to that one in Argentina. So I promise I never brought anything there, but um, you know, these, we, we did a, an also you can look at the data as kind of population trees, uh, you know, phylogeny, et cetera. And a couple of things to point out, you notice in, in Argentina, there are a couple of populations that have these blue bars as well as this, you know, like some genetic similarity to these other populations. So we also check these markers for the extra chromosomal circular DNA and the increased ETSPS. And that's what we found that Brazil and Uruguay have this increased ETSPS copy number. And those populations of Brazil and Uruguay, this marker is for that extra chromosomal circular DNA that carries the duplication. So they have it. The ones in Argentina don't. But when we looked at this population right here, there actually were a couple individuals that had it. So that suggests there was some movement, at least a little bit, from Brazil uh, down to Argentina. So again, I just show this combined example because. For Brazil, at least, they think somebody bought some machinery from the U.S. and, and may have brought the weed seed along with it. Unfortunately, in those kind of data sets, it's hard to really resolve, you know, to do the forensic of what actually happened. Bottom line, there's a ton of genetic diversity, for sure, even in these introduced populations. Now, kochia, again, here's another photo of one of these sugar beet fields in Colorado with lots of kochia. Kochia, the tumbleweed, you can see across a region here, something that we'll do is uh, Kosha also has a gene duplication. In that case, it's a tandem duplication. We have markers for it, and uh, growers, crop consultants can send in Kosha samples, and we'll run that in the lab and say, yes, you have increased copy number, you have glyphosate resistance, or no, you don't. And so just, this is an example of a map across the region of a bunch of populations. But we did some work with, you know, we had samples from Alberta, Montana, through to uh, northern Texas. And within this, um, Eric Patterson was a PhD student who worked with me is now at Michigan State. And he did the sequencing to construct that a, a mobile genetic element, and I love this, we have the, the poster of Barbara McClintock back there on the wall that talk about transposons. So it appears, at least in the, in the resistant genotypes, there's a mobile genetic element that is present next to ETSPS. And then there's this tongue. Uh, there's one version of it that's about 30 KB and another one that's 56 KB containing several genes right next to it. And so we'll just call that genotype A. That's kind of our central Great Plains one. And that's the one that we worked in first. But then we found that from the Northern Great Plains, we found what we call genotype B. So they have the increased copy number, 
they have an increase, you know, more copies of that mobile genetic element, but they don't have, uh, so we call this the type one and type two repeat. We made some markers for that. They don't have that. So it kind of suggests that may have evolved independently, uh, or at least it, it's pretty divergent from the one in the super base thing. And then here in Oregon and Idaho, there's even a third kind of genotype that uh, does not have an increase in that particular mobile genetic element. So we think that, you know, we could probably conclude that glyphosate resistance has evolved at least two, perhaps three times independently. And we also have a lot of movement. So you'll notice that we can find genotype B and C here. We can find genotype A up here. So there, there's definitely evidence of, of that movement. So how can we understand the, across the continent how weeds are moving around and potentially disrupt that would be important. Now I wanna finish up the kind of final chapter of the talk is to think about you know, what's next? How do we move beyond trades or beyond the things we're doing? And uh, of course here and in many places, great work's going on for cover crops and precision work, robotics and uh, harvest weed seed control. Eric Westra has been a, a research scientist working at CC for several years. We've done some chaff lining work in, the, in wheat and of course smart sprayers that can detect weeds from crops. So in the context of all of that, uh, the project area that I'm working on right now is uh, what you might call RNA targeting, or, you know, using a spray on gene silencing method. There's a lot in the space around RNAi, you know, so specifically using uh, some kind of double strand RNA or siRNA for particularly for insect management and diseases. So, you know, insects are great. They actually chew on things and eat them so you can get them to take up uh, a gene silencing target. The problem for plants is we've got to get it to absorb through the cuticle, the cell wall, everything. So these are just you know some examples of startup companies and lab groups working on that. What I'm working on is with a, a startup company in Philadelphia. It's called Ohm Life Tech, and Dino Aquari is the CEO there. And we have some DARPA funding to work on this. And, and so what these are, they're something called antisense oligonucleotides. So a similar concept to gene silencing, but a little different pathway rather than risk and dicer and argonauts of uh, you know, the siRNA. What happens here is these antisense oligos will actually bind to the mRNA and the ones we're using, uh, they recruit ribonuclease H, which cleaves the RNA, and then that block their, your uh, target trigger can be reused again to, to silence another RNA. Now these antisense oligos, they've uh, been approved by the FDA, four different drugs listed here. And then there's a ton of research, and that's mostly what Venus company is working on is cancer and HIV. So why does all that matter? Well, these things are very stable. And uh, the, the version that Venus company is working on is uh, what's called a third generation. So it, it has a fluorine on the, on the sugar, which makes it very resistant to degradation. So it's stable at room temperature, it's stable in water. I think it has potential to actually be stable in a in a jug and storage and you know use the dirty water and everything. So here, here you can see it's called FANA. Again, this is just a comparison of the of the antisense oligo pathway to siRNA. And what we're working on is how can these be delivered? So they have very good uptake into single cells, but with plants, you know, there's still some challenges. We ha have a fluorescence marker so we can treat roots, treat leaves, and see that it, yes, these oligos are getting in. Um, but they're kind of just not that consistent. Here's uh, some mRNA data. So you targeting three different genes in the plant. You can see kind of the control treatment scramble as an oligo that doesn't target anything. And we can knock the expression of these genes way down for a period of time, but it's inconsistent. And I can say, you know, there are times when you try the same experiment the same way and it doesn't work. So we need to improve how much it's getting in. So for that, that's where the, this new project comes in. And Katie Martin is a postdoc. She completed her PhD at uh, UC Davis. So the chemistry background, so what we're working on is nanoparticles. And when you look at the literature in this area, a lot of work in nanoparticles with RNAi, whether siRNA or double-strand RNA, it just gives them a, a certain shape or affects their charge so that they're better able to get into a cell. And we're... Our objective is to try these nanoparticles and see if some of them improve the uptake of these particular oligos into the nucleus. So we have different ways. We have fluorescent assays, a loose diffrase assay, and we'll be trying these. Then eventually we want to move into Palmer amaranth and start testing different gene targets. Uh, but you know, it's I'm really excited about this. And I, I feel like 
it can open up an area where we're, you know, can have something that can be very safe from environmental and toxicology perspective, from applicator perspective, and also very custom tailored in terms of, you know, crop safety, adaptable to new weed issues as, as things come along. But again, we'll need all the weed genomes and, and information to do this. So the, the final thing I want to share with you is about the International Weed Genomic Consortium, which is a, a public-private partnership involving a lot of institutions to study weed genomes. And really, when you step back, and one of the things I, I love thinking about weeds all the time is that what is better adapted to our cropping systems than weeds? You know, they're there and they're thriving despite everything we're doing for thousands of years to try to get rid of them. This is a, a picture of kochia again. Uh, this is a, a T4 warm season plant that flowers in the hottest part of the summer, but it also germinates very, very early in the like late winter. So it's able to survive frost temperatures, um, really cold. You don't see that very often for a C4. So, you know, could we find genetic traits from weeds to help improve crops, you know, make them more stress tolerant, for example? Again, we'll need weed genomes. So what, what we have, you can go to weedgenomics.org, the website's up now. And we have three objectives to actually sequence and annotate these new genomes, which, as you know, if you're working in any kind of non-model species, that's, that's been a challenge. So with the industry funding, you can see the four companies here sponsoring it with some matching funding from the Foundation for Food and Ag Research. We're able to generate this resource. Then we'll, we have it up. We have a website. We have online analysis tools. So everyone can sign up for this and, and then to kind of have the research coordination, get people talking together, what ideas you have, what resources you need, and hopefully to just drive those discoveries and, and new things coming out and get more people trained and working in weed science. So you can see, again, this is Eric Patterson. So he developed the, the annotation pipeline or, you know, using existing tools, but also with uh, the PacBio isoseq data for the RNA. And this is just, I love looking at this list. You can see here are 21 different species for which we have what we call platinum level chromosomes. Some of these are telomere to telomere assemblies of weeds. And uh, for the outcrossing weeds, we're actually assembling both haplotypes now. So we get kind of a two for one. And you can see things like, uh, you know, hort so actually Ag Canada, this is our, the first kind of bespoke weed genome, you know, done for that purpose, done by Ag Canada in 2020, so two years ago. And now all the rest of these have been done and uh, hopefully some species that'd be of interest for you and, and the area. And this is just gonna continue to grow. We're thinking by the end of next year, we'll probably have over 40 genomes. One example I wanna share, I guess you can't see this at the top. This is Verbascum blitzeria or moth mullen. And what's cool about this, so you probably some, or maybe some of you may not be, but the Beale seed experiment in Michigan State so uh, this botanist in the 1800s buried these seed bottles of seeds, right? And uh, every 10 or 20 years, they dig them up and see what germinates. Well, Verbastian blotteria is still germinates. And uh, so this last round, they dug it up last fall, germinated over 140 years old. And so we were able to get the tissue samples from that plant and sequence it. And that this was just, uh, I think on the ninth, we got these results from uh, Corteva where they're doing the work. 14 chromosomes, uh, three of them are gapless, so that's telomere to telomere, and no gaps in the in the scaffold. So one scaffold per chromosome. Now I'll talk about you know a, a, a possibilities to study dormancy and you know, seed bank biology. Uh, just you know really really excited for this one. Also want to share with you that there will be a, a second weed genomics conference coming up with the Weed Science Society meeting in January. So this is the kind of the Monday before there's going to be a data hackathon and some keynote speakers and no registration cost. Uh, we'll also have some funding for early career researchers. So if you're a grad student, postdoc, you can apply to that and then, you know, tack on the, the WSSA meeting afterwards. So with that, I'd like to say thanks for your attention and be happy to take questions. I want to thank uh, you know, funding, um, particularly for the herbicide resistance, uh, a lot of the crop protection companies uh, fund that research, as well as some from USDA and the DARPA grant for, for RNA targeting. And then, of course, all the great people, graduate students, and my uh, colleague, Frank Dayan at CSU, and, and other research partners for all the work. And um, again, it's been just a wonderful opportunity to be here, had some great conversations so far, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the day. Thanks. Any questions?
Geneva, anybody? Yes. targeting work, RA targeting work. Um, getting the uh, oligo through beef surface is very difficult. Have you ever thought of uh, spray the oligo turn blue with the hope that it can get through into the pollen? Because when pollen germinates, there is a pore where there's no cell wall. Mm. So mm -hmm. the oligo can go in very easily. Actually, we did quite a bit of work with um, oligo antisense, oligo transfection. Really? With apple pollen. Okay. So something for you to think about. Yeah. So for everyone online, the question was around, you know, the challenge of getting oligonucleotides into a plant and that uh, pollen cells, is particularly during uh, pollen germination, have an opportunity where there's no cell wall. And that's a really intriguing idea, yeah, because um, you could take the angle of, you know, let's try to control weeds at the early stage, but maybe, you know, you have some weeds or, or they're already there, could you stop them from setting seed, right? So maybe you could silence something critical for embryogenesis. Uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting idea, yeah. And so much of, you know, when you're thinking of ecologically based weed management and the seed bank, you know, could you, you want to run down the seed bank if you can stop that big deposit somehow uh, or have another another opportunity. I think uh, I'll definitely uh, follow up on that suggestion. Thanks. Yeah, we have one on the chat here um, from uh, uh, Brian Brown. Um, exciting results. If successful, will the FANA ASO kill weeds outright or make plants susceptible to herbicides again? And is it species specific? Yes. Um, so the different parts of that question, the, the fan ASOs would be very species specific. Yeah, and that, that will be kind of a challenge if you say, okay, in this field, we have five different species, you'd have to have an algo for each one because they, they work on a, you know, base pairing rules and they have to be an exact match. So usually, you know, 22, 25 bases long. So you would be, you know, needing to design and develop this for each species that you're after. And then the other question, could they be kind of outright kill plants or would it, uh, it would sort of have both options. We're definitely looking at, could they, you know, kind of kill plants on their own or can you kind of, if you understand resistance mechanisms, could you knock those down enough that the herbicide would work again? That was uh, roughly 10 years ago or so now, Monsanto uh, had a lot of presentations around RNAi approach but they're knocking down EPSPS and Palmer Amaranth to get glyphosate to work again. But you'll notice, I mean, we don't have a product like that now. They cut it because I think the challenges of stability of, of that um, you know, double strand RNA approach. But I think there's, there's really potential for both. In some ways, kind of maybe getting existing herbicides to work again on resistance is maybe a little bit lower threshold to jump over perhaps than standalone herbicide, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned was how, um, when uh, for some of these resistance mechanisms, there could be a little bit of selection uh, against, and, and so like uh, for wildlife versus uh, the herbicide resistance. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the how that may vary by um, some of the, the mechanisms of resistance that you encounter. Sure, definitely. So the question is, is kind of around fitness costs of resistance mutations or, you know, does a resistance mutation, would it be, can it be selected against in the absence of the herbicide? So we have examples that range from major fitness penalty to none at all. I think some of the very first examples of herbicide resistance are to the, the photosystem 2 inhibiting herbicides, and they're a target site mutation in that complex. So they have a huge trade-off. The, so the mutations make plants resistant to the herbicide, but they do photosynthesis much slower. So they they grow slowly, they make less seed, and uh, we can definitely see in cases where um, one of the main herbicides is atrazine, and um, kind of from surveying across the Midwest, there used to be a lot of atrazine resistance for uh, for with this target site mutation, 
And then atrazine didn't get used as much for a long time, especially with the shift around the brain and of course, for other reasons. But then um, now you see when you find atrazine resistance, particularly in water hen, in Hosha, it's no longer target site resistance, it's non-target site. The, the target site has kind of gone away. So even when you have that trade-off that is kind of negative, there may be another mechanism that can come along and actually outcompete it, because now it's it's more prolific. It's you know some of that mutation will make more progeny than the first one. There are also the, the I mentioned another case of target site resistance to dicamba, synthetic auxin, and it's a mutation in the dagron. So it's, um, you know, a G, uh, that glycine changes to an asparagine. Yeah, there's resistance to the herbicide, but those plants are shorter, they grow slowly, they make less seed. And so um, anecdotally, what people said, uh, like dicamba resistance, this is in coach has been around since the 90s. And there'd be a field where the grower and manager would say, hey, you know, we, the cam is not working. So people go out and check it out and, okay, yeah, it's definitely not working, take some samples. Go back the next year, it's not there anymore. They can't find it. So it's, you even have these dynamics of, um, I think, definitely how that thinness cost plays out. Now, there are other ones such as, uh, a great example, some of the target site mutations in the ALS gene, acetolactate synthase. They're, those are non-competitive inhibitor herbicides. So the, a lot of herbicides do actually compete with a substrate for binding. But in the case of this group, the herbicides block the, kind of the channel and the protein where the substrates go in. So it can look like anything. It doesn't matter what amino acids there, uh, just so long as the substrate can still go through. So these mutations will just kind of block that a little bit and the herbicide can't or such that the herbicide doesn't bind and no longer blocks the entrance, or it does even bind, but it's shifted. And uh, so there's, we see for most of those, there's virtually no trade-off at all for that resistance allele. On the flip side, also, those tend to be the much more common resistance mutations. I didn't have it in this slide deck, but uh, there's an example in France where uh, they went to the herbarium samples for the last 200 years of this grass weed, and they could find one collected in the 1700s that had one of these target site mutations that probably doesn't have much of a fitness cost, but it, it was present in a, in a sample in the herbarium, you know, so 200 years before the herbicide was discovered was out there. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. A quick question. I know we discussed it in our meeting, but could you share how easy it would be for even like a place like Cornell, maybe our plant diagnostic lab to have a facility where we could detect say polymer amaranth seeds in a in a batch of seed yeah you know yeah. What, do you, what do you think that would involve or oh 100 percent you could do it so the question is um so some of these diagnostic assays whether for species or for resistance you know we're developing these with the the standard genotyping technologies that are used in plant breeding and, and diagnostics so as long as you can run a pcr and then for that assay you need a, a plate reader that reads fluorescence that it uses hex and fan so either a real-time thermocycler, that's what we run it on, or you can run it on a regular thermocycler and then go to a plate reader. Um, but those are, you know, it's really high throughput. And as long as you can extract DNA and run PCR, you, you, can, you can run it. And, uh, but yeah, we have there, you know, we've developed a Palmer Amaranth ID. We're working on one for the kind of Cloa species. Get similar in that complex. There's a lot of different ones. We have uh, markers for Myriophyllum, some aquatic weeds, milfoil. And you could kind of go on anytime. And it, that's a great research opportunity. If you have closely related species, you know, maybe one's native, one's introduced, or they're similar, but different in some way, uh, you can definitely have more. Oh, one of the, um, is also kind of a neat story, Phragmites australis. So this is a you know, weed all around the world and it's um, their native populations in this continent and their introduced ones. And so the native ones are actually uh, important for conservation. You know, we want to keep them around and they um, you know, have uh, ethnobotanical importance. And then you have the introduced ones that are, you know, you don't want, and they're actually like in Colorado, the introduced genotype is a listed noxious species. They have to control it. And then they have to preserve the native one and you converge, hardly tell them apart to look at them. So we did one of these markers as well. And uh, so you can, you can run it, yeah. But as long, yeah, I think for sure your plant diagnostic clinic would be able to run these. Great. So we're 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 there. Great. Um, <laughs> thank you all very very much. If you want to hang around and and thank you very much. Great. Yeah. Thanks, friend.
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.